Are you here? <laughs> We've got a good one today. Got a discussion on this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. Renowned authors, journalists, music critics, and Bob Dylan experts Alan Light and Jeff Slate are joining us today. Both Jeff and Alan were guests on the show last year on separate occasions, but this time they're back on the show at the same time, together. This episode's a small panel discussion on Bob Dylan's new album, Shadow Kingdom. Real quick, please, please subscribe to Paul Leslie's YouTube channel. Oh, it'll make you happy, make you smile. We're trying to grow the channel as we approach our 20-year mark of interviews. And maybe you'll like us on Facebook, too. But it also seems to be time to begin this in-depth discussion on Shadow Kingdom, the latest release from Bob Dylan. Who's ready? Here we are. Here oh. we are. Here. Here. <laughs> Al Alan, how are you? <laughs> Is this the only way we can I, I, get apparently, together? Apparently so. Apparently it requires a third party uh, <laughs> intervening. I said yes. I will tell you, Paul. I said yes because Alan and I have been trying to get together for coffee for like two months, and 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 we both have family commitments and work Everything, commitments. Yeah, and, yeah. And I yeah. I just came off the road, so. But enough of my yak. How are you? Guys? Good, good. Thank you, uh, thank you all for being here, and I'm glad to be a catalyst in any way. <laughs> we appreciate Bye. the the assistance. Well, I'm very pleased to be welcoming these gentlemen back. The last time we had Alan Light and Jeff Slade on, they were separate, and now they're together. They Look have a that. lot in common. They are both authors, journalists. You've seen them in print. You have heard them on satellite radio, and they both know their Dylan. Absolutely, they do. And we're here to talk about the latest release from Mr. Bob Dylan talking, of course, about Shadow Kingdom. Who has it on vinyl? Well, Jeff's brandishing it into the camera, so we, we know that. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're, we're, we're all ready to roll. So I don't know about you all, and it's I guess it's a matter of just perspective, but <gasps> listening to it in the audio format, having watched the filmed version, it felt to me like a very different experience. What what did you guys think? Alan? I mean, Alan I guess I, that's certainly fair. It's, you know, the, it was such a, the, the initial broadcast, whatever we call it, the initial stream, um, was such a fascinating thing because I don't think any of us knew what to expect. Um, it was when everybody was doing these live streams because of lockdown and, I think everybody went in expecting a live performance and instead got this, whatever it was, scripted, art, art, film. art film, very vibey, very moody. Um, it As we're watching it, you're sort of figuring out, oh, the musicians in the shot are not, that's not who's actually playing this music. Um, it was so much to process and it was kind of one and done and then it was gone. So certainly it had popped up off and on on various, uh, you know, pirated YouTube streams and whatever that I, we, I imagine we all went back and, and checked out one way or another. But I feel like trying to make sense of the sound, the arrangements, the songs, the stylization, the look all in one swallow, um, it was hard to get a real sense of what this thing was. And so the chance even just to sit with it and sort of process it. I, I sort of immediately opened up and unfolded a whole lot of other stuff. Jeff, you're you're nodding, so I'm assuming that's the experience. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll go with yes. No, I <laughs> I um, uh, I 100 percent agree. And and Alan hit on all the key points, which was, you know, it, it was an art film, and it was meant to be experiential. I think, and so the audio could not be divorced from the images, and the images could not be divorced from from the audio and yet uh, now we have it in both formats for home release 
and I've done both. You know, I I got the um, you know they sent me the audio, but they also sent me a download of the film. You know, pretty early on, and I watched it, and it was much as I remembered, although better. I thought the the video you know, I guess because it wasn't streaming or whatever, it was much crisper. It, you know, it looked much cleaner. And the audio, I thought, was significantly improved, uh, it, you know, less compressed or whatever. That then is uh, true again, both in the losses form and on streaming and absolutely on the vinyl, which I, I Alan <laughs> nudged me that I was holding up. <laughs> he can tweet me. That's all right. Um, but uh, three sides and an etching, you know, no. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've been traveling. I've been on the road. I've been doing Dylan related events for the last month, essentially. And I took it with me on my phone and listened to it and, you know, didn't listen to it right away because I thought, oh, I know it hmm. and saw a review. Uh, you know, I can't remember where it was that, you know, made me want to listen to it again. And so I, you know, I sat back in my hotel room one night and put it on. And thought, oh, I'll just listen to a couple of tunes and ended up listening all the way through and was really transported. And, you know, look, he's he's tweaked these arrangements so many times over the years. And yet, you know, I can see how these can be the new arrangements of these, you know, classic songs until he changes them again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's two. There's the there's the level of trying to uh, consider the song selection itself trying to figure out what was what, what were the choices made what, 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 why? what does what, this why? add up to what is the yeah. sort of the point of this project and then these arrangements without the drums with the very you know european sort of chanson arrangements with the with the accordion you know way up front um and so there's a lot here to to try to unpack and try to make sense out of as jeff said a lot of these are songs that we've heard arranged, rearranged, re-rearranged many times over the years. Some of them not so much, some of them a lot. Um, but what's there is really is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these performances um, are, you know, clearly for, for whatever we want to try to figure out or guess about his motivation um, or, or the, the uh, you know, what the, what the intent is here just the actual performances themselves really are not like anything that we've heard from him previously yeah. and well, really well, hold up and stand up uh, on their own as, as ways into these songs. Although, although I'm two points. One thing occurred to me while you were, while you were speaking, Alan, and I looked, they've dropped the early songs of Bob Dylan subtitle, which is interesting. interesting. But, you know, I think, and Alan and I have talked about this, you know, on Sirius and, and other, and just, you know, in person, that in real doing. life, in actual <laughs> real life, that, you know, I think, I think Bob Dylan learned a lot. I mean, a lot of people dismiss those Sinatra albums. I think he learned a lot about how to use his voice and arranging songs uh, in this period of his career. I think he's, he's on, on this record in particular, He's utilizing his voice in a way that he would not have done, you know, did not do on Tempest, had not done previous to that, you know, was was starting to do certainly live after the Sinatra albums and on Rough and Rowdy Ways. But this is a whole new thing because these are songs that are, like we said, both familiar and new. And I think he's um, he's really, you know, he's really going at it as a vocalist, which I think is a testament to his voice at this point in his career, which is much better than I think most people give it give him credit for. You're touching on something really interesting, I think, even more so than the Rough and Rowdy Ways record that preceded this one. It seems like his vocals have that kind of velvety, crooning ambiance to them. And, and a lot of melody, which... You know, a lot of people have long, long derided Dylan for being devoid of melody in his in his performances. I, you know, I don't hear it that way, but I know people do, and I've been to shows with people who just, you know, sort of don't get it. But um, yeah, this is—I think this is an album for 
you know, people are going into it expecting the original arrangements and updated versions. You know, it's not going to be that. But I think if they're willing to go where the arrangements go and sort of accept his voice as a, a really good 80 something crooner's voice, I think they're going to really enjoy this and get something from it that they wouldn't expect. That, that's sort of my take. Yeah. What's really striking to me, too, is <clears throat> it really feels like. I don't know how to say it, but, you know, he's really enjoying exploring these words. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's a if there's a consistent rap about, I mean, for a long time, but certainly about sort of the latter day Dylan performances, it's that particularly with the older material, there's a tendency to just kind of speed through it, um, either use them as kind of vocal warm ups or you know, or just kind of blast through stuff in a way that doesn't feel really connected. And it makes you wonder, like, you know, does he re does he still realize what these songs are? Does he still realize what he did with these songs? And you think about when he did the the 60 Minutes interview with Ed Bradley and he said, you know, I can't write a song like uh, It's All Right, Ma. You know, I couldn't write that song now. I couldn't, you know, that that isn't something I could still tap into. And this feels like him trying to tap into the writing in a way that sometimes flashes through on stage. He could sometimes get there, but um, you know, that that really fascinating sort of spoken word performance of Tombstone Blues on here. Yeah. Which is, you know, which even in the initial Highway 61 recording is kind of all about the velocity and the right. momentum and this and just this sort of tumble of words and images and and right. you know all of this stuff that he stops all that and really sort of declaims these lyrics. Um, I, you hear him appreciating that writing, I think, in a very different way than at least than we've consistently heard in in a long time. There's a there's a lot of to that point. There's a lot of Sinatra in this, right? Right. No, mm. I think that's right, and I think it's not. Um, it's intentional. It's, it's intentional. It's always been interpretive. It's always been a matter of, for him of interpreting these songs from where he is at that given time. Right. But I think here you're very aware of, and some of these re-engaging with songs that he, you know, he hasn't done a lot of, yeah, um, that he hasn't been, that haven't been staples in the live set, um, and um, you know, and 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 as you said, sort of coming to these new melodies. But I think also really re-engaging with the words and with the idea of his the lyrics as written in a really, really interesting way. I want to go back to something that you mentioned, Alan. When I watched the audio-visual version, I did not notice the fact that there was no percussion, no drums. And then listening to the sonic version, it almost seemed like it was the first thing that I noticed. Hey, there's no drums on this. There's no mm -hmm. percussion. Did you, did you all feel that there was anything missing did you just think this is a different interpretation what did you think about this absence of percussion um you know i didn't i didn't even notice that i i mean i you know i noticed it in the audio visual version but when i was listening to it um you know i i <laughs> Alan and i have this is another thing we've talked about i i like to take bob as he presents himself to me i'm not a guy who like is interested in the people who dig through his trash or try to write his biography or you know on any given day he's going to give you the version of bob dylan he wants you to have and so i i, I don't sort of monday morning quarterback those decisions these are very um there's an ambience to these recordings that i think don't cry out for drums. And so uh, maybe that's why it didn't occur to me, but they're, they're subtle and, um, and they're beautiful. And drums, I think, would detract from not just the music, but Dylan's voice. And I think that's, that's really crucial to it. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, uh, clearly it's intentional. Yeah. I, I don't find it an, uh, an absence. Um, and I don't find, you know, I think even in the more, uh, 
you know, propulsive, even in something like that sort of revved up, I'll be your baby tonight mm-hmm. that's on there, which is the most accelerated right. of, of anything that's on there. I think they're able to still find a momentum and a, the groove, and a you know, the groove, they're still yeah. able to find a groove, still able to make that into a, a, a sort of blues rock song, even without drums and a straight ahead rhythm section. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, when this thing came out, we had no idea who played any of these parts. We had no idea where it was shot. I guess we still don't really know where it was. Yeah, still no exactly line. Where it was made. It is not the the Bon Bon Club in Marseille or whatever it <laughs> purported to be. Purports to be, yeah. um, And I guess now there are sort of accepted credits for who plays on here. I don't know when those sort of got confirmed, but somewhere along the way, um, T-Bone Burnett and Don Was and, you know, Greg Lace and some of these guys are now credited as the the band. Um, and not surprisingly, they're these are they're heavyweight players. And when you've got Don Was and T-Bone Burnett, they're guys who know how to make records. And so I think they were able to find what they wanted to find in these arrangements, um, you know, what it is that they set out to do. Um, and so I don't feel like there's it's lacking by virtue of the way that they put these things together. That's that's the the uh that's the target that that was you know that was on the wall going in yeah and i think also you know alan mentioned i'll be your baby tonight that's the, the obvious one that maybe could have drums or percussion but just looking at the track list none of these songs certainly the way they're done first of all need percussion or cry out for it the other thing is just looking at it there's only, I think, two of these that he's done in his sets in the last 20-ish years. So, you know, these are these are songs that in many ways were probably fresh to him in, you know, at, at coming, that, coming at the performances. So, you know, th- this thing about speeding through them, speeding through the ch- chestnuts in the live shows, you know, th- there's a real respect to these songs given that I think, um, you know, we all want him. We all want him to give. And sometimes live he doesn't. And and so this is it's a real, you know, it's a real special recording. And and the record is really special for exactly the reasons that um, that Alan was talking about. You know, Don was T-Bone Burnett, these people, they're they're arrangers and songwriters as well as players who know how to serve the song. And everybody here. They're, they're not, nothing superfluous, you know, everybody's serving the song here. And a lot of these songs sort of lean into the wistfulness mm. <clears throat> doing Queen Jane and Tom yeah. Thumbs Blues and Forever Young and Baby Blue. I mean, that's, th- th- those those are about that mood and about that spirit. And, you know, that's clearly what in, infuses a lot of this stuff. I'm, I am curious, Jeff, though, because since you are a musician and I am not, um, what it is, <laughs> Again, just to stay with those arrangements, what it is that you reacted to or noticed when you could spend some time and dig into it? Um, what what did you hear them going for that you know that that a non player might not notice? There's a lot of space. There's a lot of air, and and I don't mean that just um, you know it's not just space for his vocals, but there's a lot of notes that are not played. And I think that's just as crucial as we've all learned listening to blues, you know, the old blues recordings. It's not about how fast you are, or how, you know, perfect the notes are. It's about when when to lay out as much as it is to, to lean in. And these are guys who know how to do that. So so there's an air, you know, I said ambience earlier, and I, I think there's an air to it. There's a, a, a breathiness, not just to his delivery, but to the way they're playing. And certainly there's, plenty of arpeggios and plenty of notes, you know, here and there to kind of, you know, counter melodies and things. But if you, if you take that out, um, cause a lot of those are to sort of support his vocal. If you're just listening to the sort of basic tracks of the, of the music, the bass and the rhythm guitar and so forth, they're not playing a lot of notes. It, it's very simple. They're very, very simple arrangements. Um, and to make those sound as beautiful as they do is, is hard. This isn't the the Nashville strumming that he and Daniel Anwar fought over, uh, you know, at Time Out of Mind. And this is maybe, you know, when when we got the liner notes for that box set, we knew what he was looking for was more earthy and more ambient and a lot more space. This is 
sort of harkens to that a lot. I got to say, if you had told me going in that through the entire album, the primary, you know, melodic instrument we would hear throughout is the accordion. <laughs> right. I would not have expected to be able to stay with that for the duration as as effectively as it works here. Yeah. As long as it's not a fiddle, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the accordions did sound so cool on this record. You know, it occurs to me, a lot of artists, as singer-songwriters, as they get older, Gordon Lightfoot, you know, he went back and recorded a solo acoustic album, uh, which thankfully we got before his passing. But there's other people, you know, in, in, that, in, in this singer-songwriter world. Randy Newman went back and re-recorded old, old material. What do you think that this particular album, Shadow Kingdom by Bob Dylan, what does this say about this artist, Bob Dylan? I'll jump in. Um, for me, this is all about the words. You know, the, the, we've been talking about the delivery and the arrangements, the musicians and everything, but Alan hit on it er, early on. The thing that grabbed me is he's right in your ears. You know, you, you put a good pair of headphones on or you crank the stereo up. Bob's right there front and center. You're not straining to hear him. He's not rushing anything. He's really giving you these songs the way, you know, they probably should be given. You know, the respect they're given here is, is really nice. So that that's the thing that I, you know, th that meant the most to me, I think. Clearly, there's a, there's a, there's a tone, <clears throat> there's a mood that's here, and it's not, and it's in the voice, and it's in the arrangements, but it's also in this set of songs mm -hmm. that were chosen, I think, to present a certain, you know, sort of twilight uh, version from the Dylan catalog. Yeah, uh, it's really, I mean, to hear. A song that honestly, in general, I would have said, I don't really need to hear that much again in my life, which is Forever Young. In the context yeah. of a lot of these songs and realizing, I mean, look, this is, I, we've said this a million times. This was a guy who put See That My Grave Is Kept Clean on his first album when he was 21 years old. He's been singing about <laughs> death. He's been singing about old age. He, I mean, he was never a young man for all yeah. the sort of angry young man that he represented, there was always, because of the connection to the folk world, to the blues world, there was always this sense of time passing that was there. And I think that there is this, um, you know, again, this sort of retrospective feel to a lot of these songs. Yeah. Uh, they were chosen, they were chosen and chosen and put together for a reason. There's a reason that you would do Forever Young and Tom Thumb's blues and it's all over now, baby blue in a, in a set of songs together to, you know, if you were, if you're reading it super sentimentally, he's got to know that anything he does at this point could be the last thing that he does. Sure. I mean, once you're past 80 and you're still out there doing it and he will be doing it until the last day that he can do it. We know that. Um, but there is a certain amount of, um, you know, these are songs that mean a certain thing hearing from somebody in his later days like this. And after 60 plus years of doing this for a living, um, that, you know, those, those choices, those selections are very purposeful. And I think really that's the thing that's driving this. I mean, I think that's the thing that was driving the visual mood, the sort of David Lynch, you know, smoky bar at the end of days at the end of the world feel that's there on the visual side. And that, determined a lot of what this was going to sound like. I think, too, the arc of the songs, you know, the order they're in is important, similar to certainly his shows pre-pandemic that had two parts to them and were very theatrical. You know, if you really paid attention, there was an arc to those. There was a story to those shows. You know, I, I struck on this because I accidentally, you know, in prepping for the show, I turned it on and I accidentally hit shuffle on the, uh, when I put it on and it, it was jarring to hear, you know, it out of order already, you know, hmm. there's already sort of 
a, a flow to this that seems natural. Uh, and those things are not just hit upon by accident. You know, musicians, artists spend a lot of time trying to get uh, the order correct. And I think this is a really nice, don't you, people shouldn't just put it on shuffle. It was, it was well, not a and, good. <laughs> and we should mention, which we haven't, all the sort of interstitial pieces. I mean, it does play. Mm. All the way through, it does play it uninterrupted. Does. Um, it does play with these little instrumental bridges that carry from from one song to the next. Um, so it is presented, you know, very much as a set piece, complete with the instrumental at the end. That's the sort of end credits music that plays us out. Um, that's you know, it it's presented, um, and I think of you know, if if anybody's listened to this Paul Simon thing, that's seven songs that are done as one song, kind of as, you know, Prince did Love Sexy as an uninterrupted playing all the way through. This could almost be that. Like this could on a CD track as one track yeah. because he wouldn't want you to skip or move from song to song because that's the way it's presented. Which didn't, which I didn't notice. And I'm sorry, Paul, we're dominating you. But we have a lot to say about Bob Dylan. No, no. But the, the, you know, they felt a little cacophonous in the original, the, the audio visual visual version that we saw a year or so ago uh too uh, and whatever and and it was um uh and now they really do feel like link pieces you know they feel very well constructed and well thought out so yeah absolutely it just felt like one tapestry really just beautiful segues in and out of all the songs as as you all said so so clearly, I have two great guests here today, that's for sure. Now, there is one thing I, I want to touch on a little bit. You did an interview with Bob Dylan last year, Jeff Slate, and I, I'm sure there's probably things you can't say, uh, but can you give us just a little nugget, maybe a memory of that interview that sticks out in your mind? Um, I think... I think the interesting thing about, you know, we, we've all listened to Bob Dylan performances or Bob Dylan interviews where he isn't engaged, he isn't fully engaged. And I think the thing that was interesting was, you know, and, and look, any or anybody who's in their 80s can have good days and bad days or, you know, you don't have to be in your 80s. I'm 56 and I have good days and bad days, but um, uh but I think he, when he wants to be, when he wants to give you something, he can do that. I think that's true of Shadow Kingdom. I think that's true of, uh, you know, a lot of things recently. Rough and Rowdy Ways is certainly true. You know, he, he definitely came into that interview wanting to do it. It took, you know, there's, you're right. There's not a lot I can say about it. I, I, there, what I can say is it took a really long time to, as Alan knows this, because I'm like, I said to him one night, very early in the fall, I'm interviewing Bob Dylan. And it didn't happen until like two and a half months later. Hmm. Every time we saw each other, like, yeah, you know. Um, uh, so, but he said yes, to my understanding, because it wasn't going to be an interview where he was going to be asked, how did you write Blown in the Wind? Or, you know, whatever people tend to ask him. There's a, there's a great montage of questions in the introductory film at the Bob Dylan Center in Tulsa where they juxtapose the, you know, 50 years of journalists' inane questions <laughs> and Bob just sort of sitting there glassy-eyed listening to these dumb questions. And it made me realize he's been asked a lot of dumb questions over the years. And I think what, what drew him to this, the particular interview we did, was that it was for the gear and gadget section, the tech section of the Wall Street Journal. So he knew it was going to be about his book ostensibly, and there would be some technology to it, but he also knew he wasn't going to get grilled about, you know, the sort of signposts of his career. And I think that that would probably helped him dig in more than in, in other interviews. But look, what do I know about what goes on in Bob Dylan's head? I, I was just the scribe. <laughs> well, you did a great job. That's for sure. Every question I had been dying to know, here it was for my reading pleasure. It, I, I can't say one thing about that. Very early on, and I think I told Al this story, but very early on, um, you know, he wanted to know what I, what I was going to ask. You know, he's Bob Dylan. He wants some parameters. So I sent 
oh, maybe 25 or 30 questions to his office. And um, they came back almost right away. Oh, Bob likes these questions. And those sort of became <laughs> the questions that were so, you know, there was some, obviously, you know, they weren't like set in stone in any way. And, but that became sort of the parameters that we were going to talk about, you know, certain things about his pandemic experience, certain things about his experience as a young person listening to these records that he wrote about in philosophy of modern song, his book, you know, in the fifties and how he heard them and, you know, how they were delivered and how they impacted him and why they are important to him. Uh, and, you know, so those became the sort of, you know, uh, the sort of outline we stuck to. So uh, but I didn't spend a lot of time on that. It was just like, you know, they just said, oh, write up some questions for Bob, you know, what you think you're going to ask him. And I did. And that that became the template for our interview. And I think maybe that was what was successful, that I didn't really, I didn't spend weeks and weeks trying to come up with the exact right question for Bob Dylan. Mm. It was just like you. It was like, this is what I want to ask Bob Dylan right now. You know, I, re I just read the book. I'd crashed that book over one night because I knew I had to get the questions in the next morning. And I, because you never know, he might have said, Let's do it tomorrow. Um, and so that was, you know, that was part of it as well. Well, we have just a few minutes left here. And this question does not originate from me. Uh, this is from Karina, her real name. I think this is a great question. You guys have been following Bob Dylan's work for decades. You've written mm -hmm. about him, talked about him, listened to the records, read his books. So in this last couple of minutes, what keeps your attention still all these years later? Go for it, Alan. Listen, <clears throat> you know, we, we know that you're signing up for a certain sort of a project when you're signing up for a, 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 an ongoing relationship with Dylan. Um, it's not about consistency. It's not about predictability. Um, it's about, uh, you know, for lack of anything else, sort of genuine, authentic sense of his own creative pursuit. Um, and Jeff, you and I have talked about this, and I know that I sort of always fall back on my grand, you know, unifying theory of Bob Dylan is that this has been a lifelong pursuit for him of American music, yeah. of everything that goes into that. And if you look at it through that lens, it was inevitable there was going to be a gospel period. Of course, there was going to be a country period. Of course, he was going to start singing Sinatra songs. Of course, he would do a Christmas album. It's a huge piece of American pop tradition. If, if in this project of understanding all of that stuff and how it fits together, that was something that at some point he was going to touch on. So to me, there is this sort of ongoing narrative, ongoing thread um, that you're watching him continuing to work through year after year, decade after decade. And the artists that I love the most, you know, whether it's Dylan, whether it's Prince, whether it's Neil Young, you know, these are not about batting a thousand. These are not about everything is going to be great. These are about them genuinely chasing whatever it is that they are thinking about and curious about. And as long as they can maintain that, then, you know, we can, uh, we're on for the ride. I think all of the above and also you know, look, I, I came to Dylan in in a real sense after seeing him with the Heartbreakers in the 80s. Uh, you know, I was aware of him prior to that, but that was, you know, that was really significant to me. And it was, it's been a rocky, you know, road certainly since then in some respects, but by the same token, you know, the the gems are certainly there. But now that we're getting to a point where we can have some perspective on his career, on any given day, as Alan was alluding to, you can say, oh, I want to hear gospel Bob, or I want to hear mm -hmm. rockabilly Bob, or I want to hear country Bob, or, you know, whatever Bob it is, you know, Civil War Bob, you know, whatever Bob you want to hear, uh, Smithsonian Folkways Bob, and, and you can dial that up. And there's not like one or two songs. There's whole, you know, there's like whole periods of his career that you can dig into and try to you know, not figure out like what was he thinking or trying to achieve, but try to figure out what it means in the greater tapestry of his career for us as as listeners and people who've been, you know, given this gift of his songs. I know I said that was the last question, but real quick, do you all think there will be one more record at least? 
<laughs> there could be there could be a record tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, look, these the 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 performances have been released. I mean, I haven't kept up with the latest what the Europe shows have been and everything else, but um, you know, he he has said that the tour will continue into 24, right? There's at least right. into into calendar year 24 with the Rough and Rowdy Ways tour. That feels like a distinct chapter. I don't think we're going to get something before then. Um, but he seems to certainly still be enough in fight and shape and yeah. judging from his voice, you know, so on this shadow kingdom record, if that's what he can still conjure in a studio, um, yeah. it's just, is the, you know, is the inspiration there to tee up some songs? Yeah. I was going to joke that there could be a record being released right now while we're doing this. So who knows? <laughs> but I, I will say this, just having, you know, I have been following the the tour and, I listened to the Lisbon show this morning from a couple of days ago and, and he sounds great. It's a very similar set list to the, the far East shows, but you know, by all accounts, he's in physically very good shape. And if the interview that I did was any indication, he's, he's much sharper than most, you know, 80 somethings. So why not? You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure he's always writing. He, I, you know, by his own admission, doesn't write at the same clip, but then who knows what's real? You know, he could be writing five songs a day and we just don't know it yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't see why not. And I right. certainly hope so, but you know, we don't have any inside information, unfortunately. Yeah. There's, there doesn't seem to <laughs> no, be, anything, nor will we tell you if we did. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be anything prohibitive. There's no reason yeah. to believe that it, that it, that it can't happen. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the best we can do. Yeah. Well, we will leave it there. Alan Light, Jeff Slate, thank you so much for coming on here. I really appreciate it. I know all the viewers and listeners, they appreciate it too. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Until next time. All good? Okay. (laughs) Jeff, someday. You know, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by people like you. Listeners, viewers, please. Go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on The Paul Leslie Hour.